So welcome everyone to the speaker series hosted by the Forum for Equity in Elementary Mathematics. I'm Karen Economopoulos. Uh, we would like you to know that tonight's webinar uh, is being recorded so that it can be posted and shared on the Forum website. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to introduce you to the Forum. The Forum for Equity in Elementary Mathematics is a web-based resource hosted at Turk in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Turk is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to improve math and science education. As part of its mission, Turk is committed to modeling how diversity, equity, and belonging can improve STEM education and research practices to create and support inclusive learning environments and equitable outcomes for all. The Forum for Equity in Elementary Mathematics grew out of a longtime Turk project investigations in number, data, and space, a K-5 mathematics curriculum funded in part by the National Science Foundation. While the forum is informed by our decades of work on investigations and professional development related to it, the forum is not curriculum specific because equitable teaching and learning applies to every classroom in every school, regardless of the adopted curriculum materials. The newly launched Forum for Equity in Elementary Mathematics is intended to be a place for educators to reflect on and discuss equity, access, identity, and agency in the K-5 mathematics classroom. Its goal is to provide resources, publications, and professional learning opportunities to broaden and deepen perspectives and to open up discussions among educators who are pursuing equity in mathematics learning for elementary students. One such resource, which is guiding much of our work and hopefully the work of others, is a framework for equitable teaching and learning in the elementary mathematics classroom. The framework identifies four areas for consideration when reflecting on equity in elementary mathematics and considering action at the classroom and the school level. They are deep and rigorous mathematics, equitable participation in a collaborative mathematics community, strength-based assessment and accommodation, and connections to students, their families, and their communities. Today's webinar, Math, Diversity, and the Power of Story, embodies two of these areas, deep and rigorous mathematics and connections to students, their families, and their communities. Please join me in welcoming Anna Crespo, Alyssa Mito Puzi, and Marlene Kleiman as they talk with us about how picture books that combine authentic cultural diversity emotionally res resonant stories, and deep mathematical ideas can support equitable teaching and learning in K-5 and K-2 classrooms. Welcome, Marlene, Anna, and Alyssa. Hello, and thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to share my screen now. OK. So. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Math, Diversity, and the Power of Starry. Today, we'll be taking a deep dive into books that combine math, cultural authenticity, and engaging stories. There'll be story time and lots of ideas for using these books in your classroom. Please feel free to send me your comments and questions in the chat. We'll address your questions throughout the session or during the Q&A at the end. We hope you'll come away excited about using math picture books to help build your students' math skills in a way that promotes diversity and equity. I'm Alyssa Mito Pusey, an editor at Charles Bridge Publishing right outside Boston. I've been at Charles Bridge for more than 25 years, working first on curriculum materials and later on children's books. I'm the series editor for Storytelling Math. Hi everyone, my name is Ana Crespo. I am originally from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, but I have called the US home since 2000 when I moved here to attend graduate school. 
Since then, a lot happened, leading me to become a children's book author. My books cover a variety of topics and feature a variety of characters. The, book, uh, the books I will be focusing on today feature Brazilian-American characters, Lee and Louise, who speak both English and Portuguese, and they're both part of the Storytelling Math series. The stories follow a math-related storyline that I hope will appeal to you as teachers and librarians. Thank you so much for having us here today. Very much looking forward to getting to know you. Hi, I'm Marlene Kleiman. I work at Turk, um, and I serve as the math editor to the Storytelling Math series. My background is in math, math education, and children's development of mathematical thinking. I've been at Turk for 30 years, and I started out as a curriculum writer for investigations. For most of my career, I've collaborated with audiences like teachers, librarians, after-school providers, and parents to develop math materials and conduct related research. A lot of those projects have involved math picture books in some way, but my collaborators and I found few picture books that incorporate three qualities that we saw it. One is racial diversity. A lot of the math picture books in print have animal and white main characters, but few have main characters of color, and even fewer are written by authors of color or Latine authors. Yet research shows that stereotypes about who is a mathematical thinker and who is not can begin as early as preschool. And further, even the most well-meaning adults often hold unconscious bias about young children's math abilities based on race. So picture books could help to mitigate bias by showing children of color as strong mathematical thinkers, but few do so. Another important quality that we saw but did not see a lot of is math beyond counting and shapes. You all know that there are a lot of counting books out there, a lot of books on shapes, but you also probably know that research shows the critical importance of a much wider range of early math, including patterns, spatial relationships, number sounds, sorting and classifying. Children who move through the early grades with strong skills in these areas are more likely to succeed in all school subjects and research shows that includes reading. So students who start out with strong math skills actually do better in reading too. And finally, we found that few math picture books offer the qualities that we often look for in great children's literature. Many math picture books in print are concept books or stories that focus more on math than on compelling narrative, character development, and social and emotional themes that resonate with young children. Yet books with those literary qualities can really be a stellar way to draw kids and adults into math. So with that background, it seemed like time to spark some change. Um, I got support from the Heising Simons Foundation and started working with Charles Bridge to develop storytelling math to make a difference. And I'm going to turn you over to Alyssa, who's going to tell you more about the books. So Marlene and I and Charles Bridge and Turk, we wanted storytelling math to change what children's math literature looks like. To do that, uh, we had three goals. One, to offer a different, more inclusive vision of what math is and who is a mathematical thinker. The books star main characters of color, and nearly all are written by authors writing about their own culture. Two, we want to introduce important but often overlooked math topics, as Marlene said, that go beyond counting and shapes. And three, we wanted to feature compelling, emotionally resonant stories that kids would want to read again and again. I mean, in a great picture book, you know, we connect with the characters, we root for them, we care about what happens next. And we, we want to know what happens next. The story sticks with us because it has heart. And so why not expect the same of math picture books? Thanks to talented authors like Anna and talented illustrators, we now have eight board books and 10 picture books with many more on the way. All of the books are or will be available in Spanish bilingual editions. So how do we get from those three goals to all of these beautiful books? We're gonna take a look at a case study, one of our first storytelling math picture books, Leah and Luis, who has more. In this story, twins Leah and Luis love Brazilian snacks, but then Luis starts bragging that he has more and the two start to argue. Who has more? How can they tell? Leah and Luis was a big success, winning a mathical award and gaining many fans within the Brazilian American community and beyond. 
I'm gonna turn, turn the mic over to Anna now and Marlene to give you a behind the scenes look at the making of the book and how it weaves together diversity, math and the power of story. Thank you, Alyssa. So the idea for this book came from something that my parents used to ask me. They used to ask me, what weighs more, a kilo of cotton or a kilo of lead? And of course, they both weigh a kilo, but a kilo of cotton takes a lot more space than a kilo of lead, which can be confusing for a child. Now, on a side note, I always like to explain this because I always wonder, oh, they're going to be wondering. Um, you might be asking yourself, right, what a ch what child knows about lead? Well, lead or chumbo in Portuguese is used often to illustrate something that is very heavy. So, for example, someone could ask about a very heavy suitcase. Is it filled with chumbo? And so Brazilian kids might not know what lead really is, but they know it's something very heavy. And anyway, so that's uh, that was the inspiration for the plot. And after figuring that out, it was a matter of finding out the perfect Brazilian food to substitute the cotton and the lead. And the story came to life as you will see in this small sample of the book. Okay, so it's the story time. Just a quick reminder, um, keep in mind that this, in, in the entire presentation actually is copyrighted material. So we ask that you do not screenshot it or record it in any way. Um, we also, um, I wanna thank Grace Lynn and uh, Giovanna Medeiros for allowing us to use their illustrations. So anyway, we can start the story time now. Okay, so Liam Louise, Who Has More, written by me, Anna Crespo, and illustrated by Giovanna Medeiros. And it's published by Charles Bridge. Louise is always quick to brag. My tower is taller. Usually his sister doesn't mind. I know Leah enjoys taking her time. But when they run downstairs to their family store and pick their favorite Brazilian snacks, I want biscoito de povilho, papai, coxinhas de galinha, please. Louise starts bragging, I have more, and Leah doesn't like it. For once, Luis has a point. His bag of tapioca biscuits is bigger than Leah's bag of croquettes. It's taller, wider, deeper. Luis must have more. And so this will lead to a sibling dispute about who has more snacks, in which they invite the reader to participate in the mathematical thinking that eventually, as you will see when Marlene talks about the math, will lead them to figure out an answer. So now I'll go ahead and pass it to Marlene. All right. So Leah and Luis explore measurement the way young children learn best with a very hands-on visceral comparison of dimensions, amounts, and weights. We see their mathematical thinking in action throughout the story as they try to figure out who has more and just in such a real world context, everybody who ever who had a sibling who has two kids or multiple kids you see them fighting over food so um next slide first leah and louise look at general size which one looks bigger then they begin to notice and compare along three dimensions length width and height and as anna will go into later um we made those lengths widths, and heights absolutely accurate <laughs> So we did a lot of math to figure this one out. Um, okay, so then um, they compare by amount, 100 in the bag versus just two croquettes. And even you know kindergartners who can't yet count 100 objects accurately can see that there are a lot more biscuits. Then Leah thinks about weight. She realizes that one little biscuit is much smaller and lighter than a croquette. She's actually starting to think about density, which is a topic that spans math and science. 
Finally, they decide to compare by weighing, and we chose to use a balance scale because it offers a visual representation of weight comparison. When teachers read this book with their students, they can pause at different points to gather children's ideas on who has more and why. Teachers can also ask children to come up with other ways that Leah and Luis could share the snacks fairly. So I guess I should, before I turn this over to Anna, um, a spoiler here is that um, the way it ends, so Leah clearly has more because it's heavier, but um, she breaks off a piece and puts it on Luis's um, side so that, that it weighs the same and they determine that that's, that's equal. Um, but when Anna has presented this in classrooms, it sparked children's thinking about other types of endings. Anna? Yes. So one of the more obvious ways that that happened was during a virtual school visit in Denver. Um, and it was actually surprising to me because uh, during COVID, it was really hard with uh, virtual school visits. They're just not the same. Um, but these students were ready. And uh, after I read Lee and Louise, who has more, one student raised his hand and said, they each could have 50 biscuits and one croquette. And yes, they could. That would have been another way to share the snacks equally. Um, another student offered another possible way to divide the snacks that wouldn't have made for an equal division, but that showed that she was thinking about it. So the book was doing its job, making kids think, and it was very rewarding. So we try to build into the book's endings and, and different points where, you know, we're not, we'd never say stop and discuss, but um, it's natural as part of each page turn, what happens next. And to us, as we create these books, we're thinking that what happens next should have a mathematical element, an organic mathematical element. So it's not, what's the answer? But, but when you say, what do you think this character is going to do next? It's engaging the kids reading it in thinking mathematically. So asking about a one way to explore math with the kids. Um, we also built in math in some other ways as well. Each book includes a summary of the main math. And if you act in the back, we also have additional activities on the Charles Bridge website um, that you can download in English and Spanish. And some are available in other languages as well. For instance, um, Math activities for this book are also available in Brazilian Portuguese, and um, you'll get a, a link at the end that um, you can use to download everything if you want. Um, as another example, I have an example of, um, this is from our online things. Um, at the bottom, order by weight is one of the activities, and that's something that's very easy to do and to adapt to whatever kids are interested in. Um, just pick any four objects um, and uh, ideally of different sizes and weights and ask children to first make a prediction. Um, how would they go in order from heaviest to lightest? Let them pick them up to get that, that visceral sense of how heavy they feel. And then if your kids are already using scales, have them measure it and see if their intuitions are right. It helps them build their understanding of of weight, um, a way to engage all kids in this kind of activity is have them bring objects in from home, um, or you can tailor it to their interests and needs. So um, in some of her programs, I've seen Anna do an activity like this involving different types of balls. So, you know, a giant, but very light beach ball, a medium size and medium heavy soccer ball and a really little heavy baseball. And, and that gets kids thinking because even if they're familiar with playing with those kinds of balls, their first intuition might be, well, the beach ball's got to weigh more because it's so big. So there's a lot of ways that you can kind of springboard off activities like this. One of the things we make sure to do when we create these books is to ground the kids in everyday life context that where real life students are going to say, oh, I do that too, like the fighting with your sibling or sharing food in different ways. Um, 
you know, these kinds of activities give kids concrete experiences they can build on when they meet concepts like weight and density as numbers and equations in later grades. And it's a great way to get parents involved. Um, you can send the activities home and they can do it with things that they have at home. So we've talked about some of the math that the teachers and students can draw out of the book, but Anna's going to tell you about some of the math that we did to create the book. Um, math that we, we really worked on baking into the book as we kind of define some of the finer points of the mathematical details of the story and illustrations. It's on every page. <laughs> Anna? Yes. Yes, so, um, you know, aside from the traditional challenges of creating a picture book, which a picture book, which really there are many because picture books are not as easy to write as they might seem. Um, Lee and Louise, who has more, also had that added challenge of featuring a mathematical plot that needed to be not only mathematical, mathematically possible, but it also needed to be culturally authentic. And so um, the team did a lot of research and I had the very hard task of measuring the food, as you can see in the pictures. So I bought a, a, um, a bag of biscuit de povilho, I measured the bag, I measured the biscuit de povilho itself, I weighed it, um, measured the coxinha. And um, and really the idea was to make sure that the coxinha and the bag of biscuits de povilho in the story weighed a realistic weight and that the bag of biscuits de povilho also contained a realistic amount of biscoitos. And so then, of course, I had the even harder task of eating all these snacks, which happened very quickly because I can finish a bag of biscuits de povilho in like 10 minutes. Um, but all that detail really allowed us to know, for example, that in this story, each coxinha de galinha weighs 75 grams and that the bag of biscoito de povilho weighs 100 grams. And so we knew that Leah needed to give Louise exactly one third of her coxinha for them to have an equal amount. So, of course, this is not something that you're going to be discussing with your students, but uh, these are things that uh, we did to make sure that everything was realistic. Um, then Marlene and Alyssa also came up with a grid that showed the, the, the kids' sizes, the size of their hands, the size of the snacks featured in the book, so we knew everything was proportionate. So all of that happened in the background of the book. Um, and all that same detailed process to create this book was once again applied to the creation of the uh, Lee and Louise new mathematical adventure, which is Lee and Louise Puzzled. So um, aside from all the mathematical thinking in this new book, one of the things that I like the most about it is that Lee and Louise, who has more, is all about sibling rivalry. But Lee and Louise Puzzled is all about collaboration. In this book, Lee and Louise must work together to figure out a puzzle their grandma mailed them from Brazil. And this puzzle comes with a secret message. And um, even though that is not something that I usually talk about. I think a lot of it, I have two younger siblings. And so we fought a lot when we were younger. We are very close in age, just about a year um, difference. And so we did fight a lot, but we also worked together. And I think that is very real for, um, for siblings. So anyway, but the real inspiration for this book and wasn't my siblings, it wasn't um, my culture, it was actually my son's difficulty in putting puzzles together. I always loved puzzles, so whenever I was working on a puzzle, he would come by to help me, but for some reason, he had a very hard time coming up with a strategy, and so we um, worked on puzzles for kids, but his process was a simple like trial and error. He would try all the pieces. There wasn't any logic to it. And he would become very easily frustrated. 
So I decided to teach him my own strategy, which happens to be the same one that Lee and Louise use in the book. So let me show you how it turned out. Here is a sample of the book. So again, it's written by me and illustrated by uh, fellow Brazilian Giovanna Medeiros, and it is um, published by Charles Bridge. Lee and Louise receive a package from their grandma. Inside, there is a puzzle, Oba, with a secret message. Leah loves a mystery. Who is this not? Boring. Still, he's curious about the voice gift. But Lee and Louise must hurry. My mind says they're leaving soon. <coughs> Excuse me. Where are we going? You'll find out. Just finish the puzzle. Leah takes the lead. She inspects the pieces closely. They're all different shapes. But some pieces have a straight side. It's a clue. <coughs> Excuse me, I just recently had COVID and I still have um, a very annoying cough. But anyway, so this is where our sample ends, I believe. And I will pass it to Marlene to tell you a little bit more about the math in this book. So research tells us that doing jigsaw puzzles can help children build their spatial reasoning skills, but often it doesn't go into a lot of detail on what does that look like when young children are doing puzzles. Um, this book highlights some of the puzzle related conversations and thinking involving spatial reasoning that you might see from kindergarten, first grade, second graders. Leah, as Leah and Louise assemble the puzzle, they identify and compare characteristics of puzzle pieces like straight sides and bumpy knobs. And then they have to do that hard logical thinking about which of these many features are actually actually matter when you're trying to put the puzzle together. They um I'm sorry. They also consider how various pieces fit together. To do so, they need to keep in mind three characteristics and kind of coordinate them, size, shape, and color. So, you know, they have to think, is it too big? Is it too small? Do the colors match? Um, you know, is it too bumpy? Do the shapes fit together? They also have to rotate the pieces in different ways. And, you know, it's something that we might sort of do naturally when you see as adults, when you see a piece, um, you turn it you, because you think it's going to fit better in a different orientation. Um, what this book does is it kind of slows the process down. It shows it visually, not as an instruction manual, but as a way of um, just showing what Leah and Louise might be thinking. They're starting to visualize how something looks as it's rotated 90 degrees at a time, as you see on the frame on the right. They develop strategies like sorting the pieces by number of straight sides and assembling the edges first. And they connect features of the puzzle pieces to their everyday experiences. So they see that trying to fit a puzzle piece with a big bump into a small hole is a little like trying to fit your big head through a little armhole of a sweater. You can download a copy of the puzzle um, that Leah and Louise do uh, so that children can cut it up and follow along as you read to them. And Anna, I know, does this in some of her school programs where kids each get their own copy and um, can kind of figure out and sort along with Leah and Louise when she reads. Um, the book can be a springboard for engaging all kids in spatial thinking by having them make their own puzzles and trade them with other kids to assemble. Um, you can find lots of free puzzle templates of all different levels of difficulty online. Just Google puzzle jigsaw puzzle templates and you'll get hundreds of possible ones. Um, print them out, have kids draw colorful pictures on them, cut the pieces apart. Um, what I've seen work well is before they cut it apart, have them take a picture or you take a picture, put the picture on the um, front of an envelope, and then they cut it apart, put the pieces in the envelope and trade with someone else to put them together. Um, this slide shows puzzle templates we adapted so they're a little easier to cut. They have, we made um, straight-sided bumps 
um, rather than, or sort of triangular bumps, rather than round ones, which are much easier for little hands to cut open. Um, again, we have these all downloadable and you'll get a link at the end. Um, another thing you can do to bring everyone into this or have kids do this at home is have them um, print out a picture that that means something to them, whether it's their family, a pet, something they eat. A uh, place they visited, and then they can cut it into several different shaped pieces to make a puzzle and trade with someone else. And you'll see as you watch kids do this, when they do puzzles together like this, they're going to naturally talk about sizes, shapes, and orientation, and really pay attention to the kinds of things that that you want them to pay attention to in geometry. So, um, Anna, are you able to come back? Yes, good. Um, so once again. <laughs> Now that um, you've seen some of the math that kids start thinking about or that we've we've put in the book, um, Anna's going to tell you about the math that we did to make sure all the details in the story and illustrations really accurately reflect the way children would think about and assemble a five by five puzzle. Anna? Sure. So, um, of course, as you can see, the, the math in Lee and Louise's puzzle is very different from the math in the first book. And it was also a lot more difficult to get it right. First, we wanted to make sure that the puzzle pieces on the page of the book represented the real puzzle pieces, meaning there were no repeats, nothing missing. What you see on the pages, if all the pieces are there, sometimes in a few uh, scenes, not all the pieces are there, but if all the pieces are there, those are the pieces that would actually make up this puzzle if it were a physical puzzle. So for that to work, Alyssa and Marlene converted the puzzle into a grid, as you can see here. And uh, really, I'm not even sure why I am the one presenting this part of the information, because the credit is not mine at all. Alyssa and Marlene together prepared this table on this screen, making sure each page featured the correct pieces. Um, and then the Charles Bridge designers, along with the illustrators of Ana Medeiros, did the detailed work of checking every piece and making sure that they were in the right place and etc. So all, real, all that I really did was to be an extra set of eyes. So I am very thankful to all of them for the special care because they, they did make the book extra special. And of course, uh, um, changing um, topics a little bit, that means that all the incredible interactions that I have had with readers through the Lee and Louise books are in great part due to them, to Marlene, Alyssa, the designers at Charles Bridge, Giovanna, um, for all the work that they did. Um, and I wanted to highlight this one particular interaction that was my favorite ever uh, uh, um, interaction in my author career. So this past March, I had the honor of launching Puzzled uh, during a school visit in Cape Cod. Now, a lot of people think of Cape Cod as a fancy, expensive place, which it can be, uh, but not everyone living there is rich, really. In fact, the school district that I visit, there is an average of 54% of students enrolled that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. And this one specific uh, um, thing that happened, happened in the school where 75% of their students is in the free and reduced lunch program. At all of these schools, they have a very high population of English language learners and Portuguese is one of the most spoken languages in these um, schools. So anyway, so uh, it is not uncommon to see like five, maybe even more Brazilian students in each one of their classrooms. So I was extra excited to see and interact with these amazing students and really couldn't have gone better. In one of those uh, 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 visits, I had in a classroom, a group of first graders, and I had just read Lee and Louise, who has more. And it's really, it's really fun because when I am in person, I get to take them to the street where I grew up and I take them to the little 
uh, via Google uh, uh, Maps and I take them to the little restaurant in the corner so that they can see that it says South Coxinha and all that stuff. And anyway, so uh, there was a, a somewhat large group of Portuguese speaking students that were um, originally from Brazil in this um, classroom that I was talking with. And this one boy raised his hand and he asked in Portuguese, why don't Lee and Luis pay for these snacks? And I translated the question and I explained, you know, also in Portuguese that they didn't have to pay because it was their family store. And the little boy replied in Portuguese, my grandma has a store, but my father still has to pay. And so I translated the conversation to everyone else and the group included kids from other classrooms too. So it was like two or three first graders, uh, first grade classes, and there were adults too. And everyone started laughing when I translated. And so that little boy who had asked the question, he was glowing. He was so happy that he had made everyone laugh. And I think this really illustrates exactly what the language barrier does. If you um, speak, speak a second language, you probably have experienced this, that it is sometimes difficult to translate words, but most of all, I think it's difficult to translate our personalities. Our personalities are not all, they don't, we don't sound the same. We don't sound sometimes like ourselves when we're trying to speak a different language. At least I, it took me a very, very long time to sound like myself. And I still don't completely. There are jokes that don't translate and et cetera. So um, the impression that I had was that for the very first time, this little boy's teachers and friends saw his personality they saw who he really is. And so that's my hope for Lee and Louise, both puzzled and uh, who has more, that uh, they can help, that the books can help many other children be seen like this little boy was. So anyway, so that was my uh, uh, wonderful, most exciting experience in my classroom so far in my life. Hopefully there will be more. I'll pass it to you, Alyssa. Thank you, Anna. I love that story. Um, all of our storytelling math books aim to help children of color feel seen and feel empowered as mathematical thinkers and to help others see them that way too. So we have 10 wonderful picture books by a diverse group of authors and illustrators. And Marlene and I are gonna tell you about them. So in The Animals Would Not Sleep, it's bedtime for Marco and his stuffed animals. But the animals have other ideas. When he tries to put them away, they fly, swim, and slither right out of their bins. The story involves the math of sorting and classifying. Marco combines mathematical thinking with empathy as he explores different ways to group his animals so they're happy. And I just want to say as an aside, this book has um, been on a couple of lists by major um, reviewers on um, you know, social emotional learning and empathy and how it really shines for that. And that made us so happy because we know the math is great, but it's nice that people are seeing other really important qualities in the books too. Anyway, Karen um, wrote the math note for this and some of the activities. Yes, thank you, Karen. And um, in Luna's Yum Yum Dim Sum, Luna and her two brothers have six fluffy pork buns to share. But then, splat, Luna drops one. As the three children puzzle over how to share five buns, they grapple with division and fractions in a real world situation. In bracelets for Bina's brothers, Bina wants to make her brothers bracelets with special patterns for the Raksha Bandhan holiday. But it's harder than she thought. As she makes the bracelets, she explores patterns. Some researchers say that patterns are one of the most important math topics for young children. And look, Grandma Nia Lisi 
Bull wants to find the perfect container to show off his, Cher his traditional Cherokee marbles. It needs to be just the right size, big enough to fit all the marbles, but not too big to fit in his family's booth at the Cherokee National Holiday. And it needs to look good. As Bull looks for just the right container, he builds his understanding of volume, area, and capacity in a very age-appropriate five-year-old way. In Usha and the Big Digger, sisters Usha and Artie see different things when they look up at the stars. Artie sees the Big Dipper, but Usha sees the Big Digger, and cousin Gloria sees the Big Kite. What's going on? As the girls look at the stars from different positions, they explore rotation, orientation, and other spatial and geometric concepts. They learn that different people can have different perspectives in math and in everyday life. And again, Essie, Raphael wants to protect his toys from his little sister, Essie. Gathering materials from all around the house, he builds a wall to keep her out. But will it be strong enough? And what does Essie really want? When children build with objects of different sizes and shapes, like Raphael does, they learn about 3D geometry and spatial relationships. And to small Tyson, Tyson is the youngest, smaller than his four older brothers and always trying to keep up. But when the family's pet gerbil goes missing, it's Tyson to the rescue. Tyson explores proportional relationships and measurement as he looks for just the right combination of gerbil tubes to reach Swish, who is hiding under the bed. And in Yumbo Gumbo, Annabelle is finally going to learn how to cook gumbo. But she and her little brother can't agree on what type to make. Annabelle tells everyone to vote for their favorite gumbo, but each vote ends in a tie. How will they choose? As Annabelle engages her family in voting to figure out everyone's favorite and least favorite gumbos, she's gathering, interpreting, and making decisions based on everyday life data. And finally, if you're interested in books for children younger than five, we also have eight math board books written and illustrated by superstar Grace Lynn. Um, in these books, three diverse friends explore math as they play together all year long. These books include developmentally appropriate math of measurement, shape, spatial relationships, number, patterns, and proportion. So as Anna and Marlene have shown you, the process of developing a storytelling math book is really unique. The author comes up with a story idea rooted in their life experience, their lived experience. And Marlene then works closely with the author to tease out and develop rich age appropriate math that is organic to the story. Uh, we have more storytelling math books in the works covering different math topics and drawing on different aspects of diversity. If there's a particular math topic that you would like to see in the future, please let us know. You can email suggestions to Marlene. Yeah, we really do want to hear from people. So yeah, <laughs> by all means. Okay, so now it is time for your questions. Please send me your questions in the chat and Marlene, Anna, and I will try our best to answer them. Okay, so... Uh, we have, I have a question for Marlene. So Marlene, how did you decide what math topics to include in the books? Well, took sort of a two-pronged approach. On one hand, I researched what important math topics were missing from children's picture books, as well as did kind of the the literature research and surveyed math educators. But at the same time, we wanted the math to bubble up organically from the stories. So we put out calls for manuscripts and reviewed stories that authors submitted with a couple of questions in mind. To what extent does the story reflect math that children actually do in their everyday life? So we weren't just looking for a certain math topic. We wanted to really be able to say, have we, have we seen a whole bunch of five-year-olds do this outside of school? Because if it's only a school topic, it's not going to grab the audience. It's not going to make them want to hear these stories again and again and again as a favorite bedtime story. Um, and we also thought, is this a math topic that's important but just doesn't often feature in picture books? So if we already knew there were five great books out there, we didn't want to create more. Um, so we looked for what was there and what was really organic to the story. Do you, 
Alyssa, since we did this together, do you want to add anything? Well, I just said, I really, I was, I'm always amazed at Marlene's ability to collaborate with authors and like they'll have an, a story idea and it's a wonderful idea. And there's just like a glimmering of math. I mean, sometimes I'll read it and I'll be like, this is a great story, but where's the math? And Marlene will say, well, look right here. <laughs> and this could be mathematical. And then she has these really rich and rich conversations with the authors and, and it helps just helps them develop that math. And, and then when the man, when I next saw the manuscript, I was like, Oh yes, this math, I, I see it building. It's great. So, um, yeah, I, I, I owe all the math to you, Marlene. And it's, it's been incredible working with you. Okay. So, um, there's a question for Anna. Anna, why did you decide to make Leah and Luis Brazilian American, uh, as opposed to Brazilian? Oh, so that was, uh, Lee and Louise was the one, there were, I think, two books that came out first, um, and Lee and Louise was one of them. And um, and so uh, when I was writing it, I was thinking, well, this story could be set in Brazil, right? I mean, they could have a, stor uh, a story in Brazil, and they could uh, have that very similar interaction in Brazil. But... Um, but really what we what I wanted to do was to show that uh you know Brazilian Americans belong here. It's okay to speak two languages, it's okay to to uh, um to have your culture and at the same time be part of the American culture and etc. And so um to live in a dual culture house and, and, and dual language as well. And so really that's at some point, that's what I thought what would be the, the best approach for Lee and Louise. Uh, um, and that's why I decided that I would like for them to be Brazilian Americans. So, yeah. Thank you. We discussed it and it was a fun discussion. Yeah. yeah. But I think we made the right decision. It also makes the speaking English and Portuguese a lot more organically because they do speak just like my kids used to speak when they were younger, like mixing everything. And now they speak more English than they do Portuguese. Um, but, but when they were younger and learning both languages, that's exactly how they used to speak. So, thank you. Um, and Anna, I have another question for you. Oh. Are you working on any other Leah and Louise stories right now? Oh, well, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I I've written another uh, manuscript, but uh, the math is not working right now. So uh, Marlene and I have been talking and um, trying to get the math to work. Marlene is very detailed. Uh, it's incredible. Um, and it can be very helpful because she makes tables and she writes down what we're supposed to, you know, like the math that we should think about on each spread of the book and etc. And so it's on that phase right now. Um, I hope I'll be able to send you a manuscript that, you know, the story and the math work together. And I was hoping to get a soccer manuscript out there for um, the World Cup that is coming up. But uh, I don't know, fingers crossed, right? Right, right. I mean, I would, it would be so great to have, you know, sports. We don't have sports in any of these books. Something mm -hmm. really active. Um, yeah, and it, it's really interesting what you said, Anna, because uh, usually when we're editing picture books and we're looking at the story, we're like, okay, what's the emotional arc? What's the arc of the tension? You know, is it building? Is some is something always happening? Um, bringing you, uh, keeping the reader, like turning the pages eagerly. But with these books, we have to not only think about that, but also think about the arc of the math. Mm -hmm. And that's why... Uh, Marlene does all those story maps showing what math is going to be on each spread so we can make sure that yes the math starts early in the book right and that it it builds on every mm -hmm. spread and, and it's just building and building and building um in a logical kind of way that brings the reader along yeah and so sometimes so sorry Marlene sometimes what happens is that uh 
you know, your I I get so excited about this story. And then um there is a, a math comment that Marlene makes, and that makes total sense. Yes, of course it should be this way, but it messes up something in the story. <laughs> And so now I have to figure out how am I going to fix that thing that is messed up. And so those are the little things that are sometimes hard to um, to get done. But Marty, I think we make it really that. hard for the illustrators because I was just <laughs> thinking of the chart that um, Anna showed at the beginning of the the character proportion. Um, you know, it never occurred to me. how many children's books are illustrated with characters are not in the right proportions. You know, you want a, um, a five-year-old to come up a certain height on a table and, um, <laughs> and they should always, you know, they should consistently come up to the same height on a table. And when you're infusing some kind of, for instance, if it's math of spatial relationships or measurement and, and the proportions aren't right, the legs are too long that, you know, it, it messes up <laughs> so um like even for looking at the brazilian the um the different snacks we made sure that um it was the right proportion compared to the kids hands puzzle pieces each puzzle piece had to be the exact right size compared to the kids fingers and if you go back and look at lots of children's books you're you're going to see you know it doesn't work that way. Um, and it makes it harder to use those books as a real springboard for talking about math if the proportions aren't right. So poor illustrators that have to work with us have to do a really, really hard job. And we also want them to bring in authentic cultural details, yep. <laughs> which is why we we always try to find illustrators uh, with who ideally share a background with the author. Um, yeah, so, and it really shows because, yeah. like in the in the image of Lee and Louise, who has more in the store, for example, all the the other snacks that Giovanna drew, uh, uh, drew are actual snacks that you would find in a Brazilian store. So, yeah, okay, yeah, that was fun looking at all the snacks and trying the snacks that you sent us, Anna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, last question, I I guess I unless more come in. Marlene, uh, what new books are on their way that you can tell us about? That I can tell you about, yes. Um, <laughs> well, the last one that you saw, Yumbo Gumbo, the data one with um, Louisiana Creole theme um, is coming out in February. That one isn't quite here yet. And there are several of our books that, uh, that are not yet out in Spanish and those will be coming out. But for brand new books, we have a brand new topic, mapping coming out. Um, is it? in the fall, summer. Um, so kids creating maps, which is something that, that um, again, I just haven't seen it treated in a really organic kid-like way. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And we have a logic book coming out and uh, data and sorting in characters from Mexican, Mexican American and Chinese American backgrounds. Right, very exciting. So um, lots of books that we're kind of juggling and hope to be able to talk yes. about oh. um okay so i have actually one last question came in uh for anna uh, is the sock thief a math book um uh, i have been waiting for the for that book oh so. the sock thief is actually not a math book it's um it's it's a it was my first book it was published in 2015 and unfortunately it is out of print so um we i signed a deal deal and so hopefully it will be coming out as paperback in about a year or two from now but uh, i haven't heard from the publisher yet it's not charles bridge so we'll see we'll see what happens yeah uh, check your library because that's where i found it and it's a great story love it Thank you. Okay, so that's it for the Q&A section. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately, but please visit our Storytelling Math website for more information about weaving together math, diversity, and the power of story. Uh, we hope these books and activities help you spark rich conversations about math with your students. Thank you to Marlene and Anna for taking this deep dive into math picture books. 
And thank you to all of you for joining us. And now over to Karen. Thank you very much, Alyssa, Anna, and Marlene. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today and sharing your work on the Storytelling Math series um, as part of our forum speaker series. Uh, the Storytelling Math uh, books are such a wonderful example of what deep and rigorous mathematics can look like for our early elementary students. And the books, uh, from our perspective, exemplify what it means when we say that a critical component of supporting equitable teaching and learning in the mathematics classroom includes connecting to students, their families, and their communities. Because as Alyssa and Anna and Marlene expressed, students need to see themselves, their families, and people in their communities, as well as people from other communities, um, as doers of mathematics. As we finish the webinar, um, I would like to take a brief moment um, to highlight a few of the resources that are currently available or will be available on the forum's website. Earlier in the presentation, I mentioned the framework for reflecting about equity in the elementary mathematics classroom, which you can download from the website. Also available under the classroom resources section uh, tab is a student reflection tool designed to support teachers in making student reflection a regular part of their classroom. And coming soon is an associated teacher reflection tool designed to help teachers keep equitable participation at the forefront as they plan for and facilitate whole group and small group and pair work. The final resource that I want to tell you about um, today is um, about our professional learning network, which launches uh, on November 15th, uh, so next week. The professional learning network connects educators who are interested in fostering equitable learning environments in elementary mathematics classrooms nationwide. These interactive sessions will focus on exploring and discussing the student and teacher reflection tools that I just mentioned um, that are available on the forum site. Um, and um, they will also um, address um, and discuss how to, um, helping educators um, uh, implement, think about how to implement these tools in their classrooms. You can learn more about the network um, and everything else, all, all the other part of our work um, on the forum website. Um, and I actually think that Cynthia may be dropping into the chat um, a couple of uh, direct links to not only the site, but also the uh, information um, about the professional learning network. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and we hope to connect with you um, as part of future forum events. We'll be sending a follow-up um, email uh, after the um, tomorrow or, or the next day, um, sharing um, some of the resources that were mentioned, links and whatnot to the various um, uh, activities and resources that were mentioned um, in the webinar. So thank you once again, uh, Marlene, Anna, and Alyssa, uh, and thanks to the behind the scenes Turk team for uh, um, hosting the webinar um, and we hope to see you soon. <laughs>